right. Um, so I get to talk about the state of the pub Debian plugin today. And uh, in case anyone doesn't know me, my name is Quirin Pump and the contact is on the slide. I'm only going to have that one slide. I don't actually want to mess about with slides too much for this remote conference format. Um, yeah. Kieran, if you could just reintroduce yourself. I'm sorry, the recording just began. Okay, so my name is Quirin Pump and I work for ATIX and I am currently the primary maintainer, I guess, for the Pulp Debian plugin. And I'm going to talk about the state of the plugin today. And um, yeah, so again, this is the agenda here on the HackMD. But I really want to start talking. So the state of the Debian plugin, and as the timing would have it, and as a matter of providence, the state is that we just recently released version 2.6.1, which was the first GA version we released after some eight beta releases or something like that. So we're quite pleased. The, so the current state, very short, is uh, we recently went GA. Or, general availability and drop the beta status. So, um, right, and um, the big question now is what exactly does this even entail um, that I want to talk about? And I should very quickly say that uh, the plugin is called Pub Debian, but it really is a apt plugin, so it can manage apt repositories, whether those are Ubuntu repositories or Debian repositories or presumably Linux Mint repositories. I haven't tested any of those, but I presume they use the same format since they are a Ubuntu spin-off. Um, yeah, but I will keep talking about Debian because it's easier that way. And OK, so. <laughs> What does the GA status, or essentially I declared the pl plugin no longer beta recently. So what does that entail? I, I like to joke that this means there are now no more bugs in the plugin and there will never be any bugs in it ever again. Um, but no, of course it's uh, not about bugs. It's we have now implemented the basic feature set that we were aiming for from the get-go with the part three version of the plugin. And we have done some basic testing on that feature set, um, including all of our sort of known niche cases and problem cases that we had to deal with with part two. Um, but probably not every niche case out there. So I expect there will be more bugs. Um, we've written some basic documentation to uh, give the community user at least a fighting chance to use this plugin uh, uh, to know, yeah, how how or how how to a fighting chance how to use it and how not to use it, um, or how they might want to use it or not use it. Um, I've had a, some practice now with just sort of the basic plugin maintenance and release process, which means I feel comfortable now maintaining the plugin going forward, which is important if you're going to call it stable or ready for production. And I guess the last thing is that we've, with this GA announcement, entered a new development phase for the plugin. So the way I see it until now, we've been sort of working many hours and uh, almost full time often, me and my colleagues, trying to just get that basic state done where we say the basic feature set at least works for the common cases. And going forward now, it's more going to be, well, we believe it basically works. We have some test coverage and we're obviously going to fix bugs as they come in and we're going to add new features as, as needed, but um, we're not going to be working on the pulp issue tracker full time. Sort of, we're gonna go back to integrating that into our general Attics development workflow. Um, okay, 
And before I go into detail on like the features that I've just talked about, what that basic feature set is, I want to just go back one more time how we got there. And um, so from my point of view, there were sort of two phases to this. And uh, the first phase is sort of the initial implementation that was all done by my then colleague, Matthias Delvik, who is here in this talk today. And uh, as many of you know, the he, he, he really did the entire initial implementation almost entirely on his own. I was involved on maybe the sort of design discussions early on. And then eventually when it became clear that he would switch to the pulp core team and work there, I was maybe given some help with the handover, but the initial implementation is all his. And I'm sure he would subdivide this phase into many more phases, but from my point of view, it was really him working on this 100% of the time. And then there was a what I like to think of as the handover phase, which started while we were still both working at ATIX and has only really concluded now with the GA release of the plugin. Um, yeah, and so in that initial implementation phase, actually the whole feature set was already there that I'm going to show you today. So the question is, what did I actually do in this handover phase? And well, again, it was a matter of like going through all the known corner cases we knew were problematic from Pulp 2 and uh, making sure that all the like community bug reports that were already open were dealt with. So um, making sure we had enough test coverage for all of our weird corner cases and making sure I actually know how to maintain this plugin going forward. Okay, um, I mentioned we wrote some documentation, which is where I will continue now. So I hope you can all see that. Um, yep. Yeah, we have a, so because I want to quickly introduce what is that basic feature set of the now released PubDep plugin. And we added something to the documentation or a chapter called feature overview, which does not exist in the plugin template. And it's basically meant to give a sort of high level entry point for community users of the plugin that isn't as sort of detail or uh, example oriented as the workflow section, but gives you the broad idea of what, what you can and cannot do. Also, it's a bit of a fudge because I wasn't going to have the time to write detailed workflow documentation for everything. Uh, so I thought this was my best chance to make sure everybody gets that fighting chance to use this plugin. Um, okay, it's a Pulp plugin. Of course, it has some content types. Uh, that's not really, I'm not gonna go into the detail of that now. If you want to know about the content types, added by the Debian plugin, you can use the REST API documentation. So I'm just gonna quickly show that we have it and open that here. And all of the app API endpoints that start with content here in the description describe some content type, either for metadata or for packages. And if you're interested in the details, you can go ahead and read that. Um, but I wanted to talk about features. So the major feature, I guess, is repository synchronization. So you want to be able to synchronize upstream Debian repositories, Ubuntu repositories. Um, and you can filter uh, repositories either by distribution component or architecture, which is also important because if you know the main official Debian repository, it has absolutely everything in there, a dozen architectures and uh, every Debian release that ever existed. So you can synchronize just a subset of that. And we have signature verification. So you can add a GPG, a public GPG key to your remote and it will check release file signatures as it downloads them. 
then so repository synchronization is the one way to get content into your pub instance, uh, the other one being package uploads. Uh, I'm not going to talk about package uploads too much because they essentially work the same way as for any other plugin. Um, you can upload individual Deb Debian packages to the plugin and it'll be in your repository version. So once you have obtained some content, either via synchronization or package uploads, you then have to publish and distribute it if it's going to be any use, if you're going to use it for your hosts. And here we have the simple and the structured publisher, or the main app publisher, which has a simple and a structured mode. And this basically recreates the same functionality we had in Pulp 2. Um, so in Pulp 2, we had also the simple and structured mode where the simple mode would just publish all the packages in your repository version in a default all component, a single component, and the structured mode would recreate the uh, structure of the upstream repository that you synchronized. And we also have metadata signing. So if you create a signing service, uh, you can then sign your publications with that signing service and yeah. And the really exciting or the one feature that is totally new and I guess in some sense also perhaps the most interesting to people from Pulp Core and other plugins because there's always sort of rumors and whispers that Pulp Core might want to have something similar or that it might eventually be moved something like this into Pulp Core is the verbatim publisher. And the verbatim publisher basically takes whatever you synchronized into your repository and republishes in, in exactly the same way as it was upstream. So it's basically a mirror mode or could also be referred to as a mirror mode. Uh, if you've only synchronized a subset of the upstream repository, it will, of course, also only publish that subset. But anything it does publish will be the exact file that was pulled from from the synchronized repository with the exact same checksum, with the exact same signatures and everything. So basically, in we have a single we have a single sync for synchronizing upstream repositories. And it downloads a bunch of artifacts that it doesn't actually need for the simple and the structured publish, that it only publishes in the verb verbatim publish, because the simple and structured publish will generate their own metadata files, for example. And the verbatim publisher will use the upstream metadata files that it downloaded. And it will also publish a bunch of installer files and installer UDEP packages. And therefore, it's the only way or provides a proof of concept for actually installing uh, Debian hosts using the Debian installer from synced pulp content. And I guess the broader application is that the verbatim publisher is basically totally independent of any Debian specifics. It's only dependent on what your synchronization pulls down from the upstream. So it could be a pulp core feature in theory, because it will just publish every artifact with the exact relative path that it had in the uh, where it was pulled from. Right, so I wanted to ask if there's any questions at this point before I go and do a demo of all of this. I just had a question about uh, verbatim publishing. How are you storing like the metadata or the repository data when you sync so that you can reuse it during publishing? So just as an artifact, so the upstream metadata, for example, the release file is downloaded during sync and stored as an artifact uh, along with a, an appropriate content type. And then if you do a simple or structured publish, it just ignores those artifacts and will generate its own metadata instead. And if you use a verted BIM publish, it will just basically loop over every artifact that you've ever synced and just put them back to where it was or 
to the same relative path as it was before. And this will include, for example, the upstream signatures. And I guess I will switch over to the uh, demo now because there we're going to be able to see it. Um, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that, I had the same question, David. Thank you for answering that. Um, kind of related to that question, what about um, uh, some of these artifacts are those, the metadata files themselves, which David was just asking about. What happens when users compose their own repositories? Like they add or remove a single uh, package. Those Back those yeah. those won't be included. So right now, the the verbatim publish is only useful for um, synchronized repositories. So it's really if you want to mirror an upstream repository or a subset of an upstream repository, you can use it. But it doesn't work uh, for like creating your own repositories locally and publishing that. And that's actually, and yeah. If I if I synchronize an upstream one and then I modify, I create a repository version that's the modified version of it, and then I try to verbatim publish it. What would happen in that case? Um, yeah, it will still publish everything that's there, including the new packages, but the metadata won't match them. Cool. So yeah. it's just a it's just a not a correct thing, repository. Yeah. Yeah, that's so that's it's, fine. It, totally, it's, it's yeah, actually it, it's actually good, Matthias, that you raise your voice because I should have said uh, this is probably the feature that I have not touched at all because it's actually a very stable feature once you've built it. Right? It just in quote unquote stupidly republishes whatever is there exactly where it should go. In like five um, lines of code. Exactly. And so I have, I may have touched the sync, and it's of course dependent on what comes in from the sync, but I have not touched the verbatim publisher. Yeah. Cool. That that's great. Um, thank you for that. Uh, my other question was um, about signing features. Just before we get into the demo, are there? Can you talk a little bit about what? Are there any signing features? Um, yeah. So the the signature. Verification is uh, fairly simple at the moment. Uh, basically, you add the public GPG key, and since for Debian repositories only the metadata gets signed anyway, it will just check if it can find a metadata file with a valid signature and throw an error if it doesn't, or it will loop over all the metadata files it finds on the upstream repository, discard any that don't have a valid signature. And if there aren't any left, it will be like, nope, can't sync this. Um, and otherwise it will say, okay, I verified this, it's fine. And I just keep doing what I always mm -hmm. do. Uh, for signing, it uses a signing service uh, as is described in Pulpcore. Let me actually go back to the documentation um, for signing. So in Pulpcore, there's this notion of the ASCII Armored Detached Signing Service, uh, which has some documentation in Pulpcore for it. And basically, the signing service we use is just a uses the same parent class as the ASCII Armored Signing Service and otherwise works the same way. So you create the signing service, which does not have an API endpoint. You have to do it by loading Python libraries and running some script. And then the signing service has a reference to some shell script, which needs to, which is verified at the time of creation that it provides signatures the way the signing service expects. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, OK, demo. Um, so I'm going to be fully honest. I've already run all of these commands, mainly to make sure that the sync goes fast. Um, but so I have here a running pulp lift pulp development box uh, from pulp lift running the release version or the release branch of the plugin and the two, no, three, six pulp no, core release. Um, yeah, and uh, I've run work on pulp, so I can run HTTP requests. And so I've the first thing I have to do is create a remote. Actually, I'm just going to 
exactly. Since I've already done this, I need to change my entity's name because I'm going to need unique names. Um, so I'm going to create a remote for my oops, upstream repository, which uses the plugin remote endpoint and uh, uses the following upstream repository URL. Uh, we can have a look at the upstream repository here. This is it. So this is the exact same URL. And so I can just create that remote and I can create a repository for it. And once I have that repository, I can sync the remote into the repository. And then I'm going to just check if the sync has finished. And it has, like I said, I synced it already, so I didn't actually have to download any packages. Then I need to create a publication. And this is now going to be the normal app publication with both simple equals true and structured equals true. So it's going to use both publication modes. And yes, so I need to extract the link of the created thing. I need to create a distribution for it. And then once I have all that, I can, uh, yeah, I can check what the publish, so the base URL is for that publication. And I can just go ahead and have a look at that in a browser. So this is the one I built before in case the demo doesn't work and I need to fall back to something. And now I just renamed it to Tuxedo2 and it's there. Um, yeah, and so I limited what releases I downloaded to just Bionic. So this is actually an Ubuntu repository, not a Debian repository. And what we see here is the default all, that's the result of the simple publish. And the Bionic main is the result of the structured publish because that's what the release was called in the upstream repository here. Yeah, in the upstream original. And now that I have done that, I can just go ahead and create a verbatim publication for that exact same repository as well. Exactly. So I don't know, I've heard that there is perhaps in other plugins, you can do a publication and a distribution in one step. Uh, we don't have that in the Debian plugin. I'm not sure whether that's something I need to add at some point or whether that doesn't work for Debian for some reason. No, no, I don't think. Yeah, it doesn't have exist that yet. Yeah, we don't have that feature yet, but it is planned. Okay. And well, every plugin will have to implement it on their own. Okay. <laughs> um, right. So this is now my verbatim publication. And the thing we can see is if we compare with, let's say, this Bionic here, I didn't provide any signing service. So I have just a release file and no signature files. Here in the verbatim publication, if I go to Bionic, I have an in-release file and the release.gpg file, which is exactly what we had in the upstream repository. Uh, where am I? Here. Yeah. And uh, I guess I could now download those and uh, show you that they are really the same files, uh, but uh, I, you know, you're just going to have to take my word for it. <laughs> and I can show one more thing. So now I have these publications and I can actually include them or include this repository that I've published on my laptop. So I'm running aptitude here and apt package manager. And you can see if I just update, well, you can see that I should run upgrades at some point, but I'm not going to do that on the day of a presentation where I want to hold a demo. Um, but otherwise I have 
these packages here already. And now I'm just going to add the pulp repository. I need to say trusted equals yes, because I did not add a signing service. So there's no signature on this repository and it uses exactly the repository we just created or the one I created before. Um, but yeah, and then if I update my package index, uh, it's loading. We see 44 new packages. And uh, yeah, let me just see. We can see that these are have tuxedo packages, which come from the repository that I added before. And if the permissions work and I've checked for this package, I can also go ahead and install this package on my laptop from Pulp, which is a bit silly because this is a Debian system and the repository is meant for Ubuntu. So a lot of the dependencies don't actually work, but for the proof of concept, I guess it's fine. Yeah. And there we go. So that's very quickly, like one time from front to finish, synchronizing into Pulp, serving it to, in this case, to my laptop. Or synchronizing, publishing, distributing, and then using it. Um, yeah, is there any more questions at that point? If not, then I would just continue by talking a little bit about what to expect going forward. Um, and for that, I'm just going to open the Pulp Dep issue tracker, which, of course, anyone can go to and open issues. And also, actually, I'd like to take this opportunity to say that uh, community users who installed both the beta versions and now the release have generally been a huge help in opening very high quality issues and um, which I guess takes effort away from our own testing department and also uh, hopefully makes the plugin more robust because nothing against our testing department, but we all have tunnel vision and we all always use the same three test cases. And uh, in this case, uh, we get community feedback. Um, and we've actually found uh, some new classes of repositories that don't work since we did the stable release, but those haven't worked in Pulp 2 either. So it's going to be a new feature one day. Um, exactly. So what do you expect going forward? So I will obviously keep maintaining this plugin when there are new Pulp core versions and uh, release compatibility. Uh, releases or do compatibility releases. And we will obviously keep fixing bugs as they come in. And we will maybe add some features. But I'm going to be like perfectly candid at this point. Sort of the the use case that matters to my employer is the Catello use case, which means that for new features, I will probably not get time to work on them unless they are interesting for the Catello use case. Um, and which is why I am fudging the use of uh, epics a bit here in the uh, issue tracker to basically collect issues that I say are certainly uh, immediately interesting for the Catello use case. Then I have one for collecting testing issues, which are important to me, which I will hopefully, or we will hopefully still work on. Um, and then there's the actual next version where I will only move the features to once we start working on them. Uh, and then there's this wish list, which is basically a backlog and unlikely to receive that much attention unless there's some community input. And if there ever are, I don't know, other community contributors to the plugin, I will, of course, take the time to like help them contribute to the best of my ability. But yeah, our focus is probably going to be things that are relevant to Catello usage. 
And the other thing that is next on my to-do list is the Pulp 223 migration plugin, which we are also going to need for Cotello. And right. And then I guess the final thing I really wanted to talk about is uh, so what what sort of challenges and lessons have there been while or yeah working on this plugin? Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna sorry. And um, So uh, I could talk about sort of the uh, technical challenges, which were mainly to do with what I like to call the original sin of Debian repository format specification. Uh, but that's probably not that interesting to everyone here unless we still have time at the end or something, uh, because that's just like the, the technical challenge that has been eating a lot of my development time and Matthias's time before then and my colleague Manisha's time. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, because uh, the way that you find release files is not very strictly specified in the Debian repository format specification. Um, but I really want to talk about sort of my experience as a community plugin maintainer. And so I wanted to start with the good points first. So the first thing to say is, um, this is a hugely supportive community and is always available on IRC for all my questions and uh, generally nothing but helpful. Also, you do a great job of automating everything and uh, maintaining the plugin template. And uh, so for somebody who is not working on this project full time, there's lots of ways to keep maintaining this plugin. And there's lots of documentation so any complaints I may have are basically complaints on a very high level already, I find. And uh, so the, the kinds of complaints that remain or the difficulties, and some of them are probably unavoidable anyway, uh, are first and foremost, what I already spoke to in the other talk, um, just the pace of things in Pulp Core. So there's lots of people clearly working in Pulp Core and adding lots of new features. And this can be a daunting pace if you're not working on it full time. And if you're not sitting in on all the meetings and so you do a good job of communicating everything on the mailing list. There's the deprecations for the plugin API in new Pulp Core version. So it's all there but it's just pretty fast. And I I'm imagine some of that will stabilize and it's just down to the part two to part three rewrite. Um, but it's something, yeah, that has been a challenge for me. And, and I'm not personally a huge fan of the word pulp four. <laughs> now, um, I imagine actually uh, Pulp 4 won't be comparable, or the Pulp 3 to Pulp 4 will not be comparable to Pulp 2 to Pulp 3. So it's probably uh, more of a psychological thing. But yes, uh, it, it's when I guess, I mean, there were talks about it yesterday, I think. And when I hear Pulp 4, I'm still a bit shell shocked and I'd concentrate on getting the command line interface ready and adding adding those features and not on rebuilding the <laughs> uh, yeah not not adding lots of breaking changes is my my personal hope and then maybe at some point do the breaking changes once I've had a chance to recuperate and I'm ready to do, put in more work <laughs> um, and the other thing are sort of details. So one of the things that has been, that took me an age to figure out what it was all about is this static API JSON file that you need to regularly check into source and is somehow needed for the documentation and sometimes generates itself in my repository. And I'm glad to hear there's now work being done to automate that and get rid of this or requirement. But that's the yep. kind of thing where like, it just 
took me forever to figure out what branch do I need to check out when I generate this thing and which version of it do I want to check into source and when before or after a release or yeah. And um, other details, I guess, so it took me a fair time figuring out the release process. And it's also, I mean, of course, I recognize to some extent as the plugin maintainer of a community plugin, I have a lot of freedom. So I don't have to use the same release versioning as Pulp RPM does, I guess. Um, but I guess it's useful for me, or I think it's useful to try to emulate the sort of what, what the big larger pulp team is doing as much as possible because you build all of this automation, which makes my life easier. And yeah, but there's also, again, you have churn, things change. And yeah, it took me a while. What was one of these other details? So I kept trying to work with the wrong pulp lift box and it kept breaking and not working because I was, I think, using the CentOS box. And at one day somebody told me on IRC because I was complaining about something that wasn't working to use the Fedora box. And since then everything has been fine. <laughs> so it's these, these details that can take some time to filter through. And, but I'm not sure if there's some super easy solution to this. It's, it's, I mean, Again, it's probably it it gets easier when there isn't as much churn because then the documentation is going to be more up to date. And there is a lot of documentation, of course, with documentation, it's always a bit of a challenge. Do you find the correct documentation? Or so so I guess the thing is if 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 I can have like one hint or something is um having full freedom to like use the upstream issue tracker or not, or use this feature of the plugin template or not is good if you're in an open source community, but having some guidelines at the beginning for suggestions, what the suggested way of using it is, is helpful. Yeah. And I think that's basically everything I wanted to say. So if there are more questions, i will be more than happy to answer those. I just want to say that it's Mike, a developer. Mike, you, you broke up really badly for me. I think I missed almost all of what you just said. I'm sorry. Yeah, please repeat it. I just want to say it, it like it warms my heart. Yeah, uh, like, broke up again. <laughs> okay. Take your arms your heart. I just want to say. Maybe we write it in the chat. I'm really glad to hear that, that you're having an overall positive experience as a plugin developer. Yeah. Yeah, I think I do. I mean, it's, it's you, there's a lot of automation that can sometimes take a while to get into, but it's helpful once you've gotten into it. Uh, there's the development environment, which once you have that Vagrant installation running and the PubLift box up, it's very useful and more or less easy to use. Um, and you have the plugin template, which is a big help. And I guess for, or yeah, there's, I guess, today going to be a session on using all of these tools, which I think I suggested. <laughs> um, so that's basically like my remaining details or something that that that's what that kind of session would be for. And that's why I guess I suggested that session. So I'll, I'll make sure I'm in that. Um, and uh, the one thing I'm kind of sad about is that my colleague Manisha, who also did a lot of work recently on the pub that plugin can't be here today because she's finishing her master thesis. But and so she can't use this this year's PulpCon, I guess, as an opportunity to introduce herself to the community. But um, I think the 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 plan is she will be starting at ATX full time starting next month, uh, or maybe the, I'm not 100 percent sure about the date, but soon once she's finished with her master's thesis. So I'm sure, yeah, there will be more opportunities. Well. 
Awesome. That's really great. Very cool. Good. And I've got a question. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, I'm taking the leap here. I want to say thank you so much for taking up the work there. Well, I guess, uh, again, 90% of the credit goes to you for writing this plugin. No, no, writing the and churning out all the bugs is at least as valuable. Uh, Kieran, I have a question for you with regards to migration part. You said yes. it's on your list. Uh, do you have any idea for the timeline? OK, so the basically, I, I guess for, for me, it's now that there is a GA version of the plugin, I will probably not work or I will not spend all my time working on trying to get there anymore. So um, what I will do is I will probably delegate the bugs that come in, and we have three of them already, uh, or bugs and features uh, that we definitely want to keep working on. Um, I, so Manisha will probably work on those once she's back. Uh, and I will concentrate mainly on the migration plugin starting next week. Um, I So my very, I mean, I obviously opened a PR on that once, which is probably three miles away from current master by now. Um, so my first thing will be to rebase that and try to get it back into the same broken state that it was already in several times. <laughs> and once I've done that, I will I think it's a matter of understanding the main sync pipeline that does the heavy lifting in that plugin. And so that will be my next task. And I can't say how, how quickly I will get past that block I've experienced every time I've gotten to that point uh, in the past. I may also have others at ATIX look at that as well. So, I mean, I think I need to rebase it since I, started it. And once it's rebased, I can have everyone else at, at ATIX have a look at it as well. But yes, so it will be my main focus going forward starting now. Because we want to get at least a version that works for the something. Like I think if, if, if I can get to a point where there's something that can be merged that is able to migrate like maybe just packages for the start, then that will be become much easier to build on top of that than uh, if there's just always this issue branch that doesn't work <laughs> and needs to be rebased. And yeah. Incremental uh, change is always good. Yeah. Uh, so so yes, my, my real immediate goal is to get some so some in intermediary step for the migration plugin that has some functionality that works and then build on that, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> uh, yeah. Quidin, I've got a, a quick question. Well, hopefully quick. Um, when you talked about the, the rate of change and churn and, and the stress that that gives you, um, between 3.0, the, the GA release in December of pulp core, and now there's been a certain amount of churn that was things like deprecations and changing of API and the tooling change, and they were, they were big and your whole environment had to change. If we were at the point of releasing a new wire release every month, but the only thing you had to do was update and everything mm -hmm. just worked, would that, is that a different kind of churn than, than the, what's giving you stress right now? I mean, I think to some extent, it's it's more of a so so the, the first thing is I think I do have a much better idea now of like how the release process works so I'm not as scared of pop core releases new ones anymore as I was maybe in the beginning and then the the same thing with like so what for me what what ate a lot of time at sometimes is like so I don't work on it full time and then there's like a couple of days where I haven't worked on pulp 
and then I want to keep working on pulp. And then my pulp lift box was broken by then, or I didn't really know how to which pulp core to use it with or whatever. And then I spent half a day fixing pulp lift until I could continue working. And yeah, so I think I've basically, I mean, to some extent that were sort of takeover difficulties. And now I have some routine in it and I've documented some of these things. That's actually maybe also an interesting point. So I have written some documentation that isn't in the plugin template either on just plugin maintenance for the Debian plugin, um, which might be interesting if there ever are other like community plugins to the to like those people. Um, and and That's it's of not. course so it's for myself because I will not. I will forget things by the time there's a next pulp core release and I need to do it again. And it's for my colleagues because maybe they need to do it at some point when I'm on holidays or something. I mean, they don't currently have the push rights, so, but they can still do all the preparation and then ask somebody at the pulp team to, to push the tag, I guess, if it ever, you know, if that situation ever comes up. Um, so, and the other thing is, I think, yeah, the churn has slowed down. So um, also now, I guess, with the next pulp core version, the plan is to no longer peg uh, plugin versions to only a single pulp core version. Um, I think that that will help because it's it'll it'll take the or it will hopefully yeah, in the future remove this need to release immediately after there's a new pulp core release. Yep. Um, even if nothing's changed. Um, yeah, yeah. And that, I think that was kind of part of what would break your development environment also is, uh, you know, pulp core gets updated and your plugin still has a dependency listed as needing the older one. And it, those types of failures in provisioning are not always obvious. And you spend time um, figuring out what exactly changed. And it's just like a version number and not an yeah. actual significant and, but change. I want to add the change that we want to support multiple core versions with the plugin is mostly to make it easier for the user. Oh, definitely. So yeah. <laughs> it may add a little more testing on the plugin writer side. I think it's easier for the plugin writer as well. Yeah. Because it just means that. So I release uh, the next pulp version will be what two, or the next pulp Debian version will be for a Y release will be 2.7, which will be pegged to pulp core 3.7, but also 3.8. And that means eventually the 3.8 will come out and I won't have to release anything the next day. I can just like take my take the next week to look through the uh, deprecations and the whatnots and decide what to do about it. Yeah, it, um, I think we should retitle that uh, part of our changelog to the deprecations and whatnots. I think that would be great. Um, <laughs> about that policy uh, specifically, if you could, um, and really all plugin writers, as we go through 3.7 and 3.8 pulp core release timelines, just like you're saying, if we could get some feedback on whether this actually pans out um, in the way that we think it will and whether this was helpful or not helpful, I'd love to hear that feedback um, at some point because what we might consider doing is lengthening this deprecation cycle even longer, perhaps. Um, and so let us know how it feels, um, I, I guess, in three months, four months, something. I guess I expect like the the full analysis will only be possible then once once one has to release three eight, which should then be compatible with three eight and three nine, because I guess some of the difficulty might just get deferred because then I basically I can't release three eight until I've gone through the deprecations, if if I understand the the concept correctly. Yeah, right. it sounds so like you do. I, I have I have between three seven and three eight to figure out the deprecations and then I can do the next release. Yeah. No. Yeah, I will I will keep sure keep talking about that because yeah. <laughs> Only quick question for Karen. 
Um, whatever happened with the Postgres extension? Was that was that rewritten or was that just not used? Uh, that's still an open work in progress pull request, and uh, I think so. Uh, I'm 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 I'm. I don't have, I, I'm slightly confused about the exact details at the top of my head right now, but uh, that this, this Postgres extension, it exists, or the idea is to eventually use it for Catello and for Pulp as well, right? And uh, it all hinges kind of on getting the packaging done, at least on the Catello side, or maybe also on the Pulp side. I'm, I'm not 100% sure what the okay. last state was. And I think realistically, I will probably t work on it once it's done or for the Catello, because I think we're further along in integrating that into the, maybe Marcus is here and he can say something about it. But I think we're further along in doing that work for Catello than we are doing it for Pulp. And if we do it for one first, it will be easier to do it for the other. I okay. think that's my thinking on it right now, but I'm a bit fuzzy on the details. Okay. Yeah, I knew it was the goal was to use it with the pulp plugins. I just didn't know the status of that. Um, yeah. But that's fine. The 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 root problem was that binary extensions in Postgres have to be enabled by root, um, and that presents deployment challenges. Yeah, um, and I think um, well, the other the other factor is that the migration plugin will come first. So. Yeah, that makes I, sense. I, I, I don't see myself putting much time into this until we have some progress on the migration plugin. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Kieran, um, I would just want to thank you. We are at our time for today. Uh, this has been a really wonderful, excellent presentation. Um, and that's really the culmination of a whole bunch of huge work. And I just wanted to say personally, thanks for um, all the effort and also um, showing such care for your users and for coming here today and sharing this with us. Well, thanks to all of you. It's been it's been a pleasure, yeah, working with everyone, and it's been nice continuing to work with old colleagues who are still colleagues in some sense. <laughs> and uh, yeah, wonderful. Um, I'm going to uh, stop the recording now, and uh, this will be available on the YouTube channel uh, later. Let me stop this now.